Hi everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove. I'm here today with another Omnibus review. Uh, today I'm going to take a look at the X-Men uh, slash Avengers Onslaught Omnibus. Um, this is a huge book, a huge colossal event um, that occurred, I think, in uh, around 1996 for Marvel. And it is pretty much the epitome of the kind of massive scale, bloated, crossover event um, that was so kind of prevalent in the 90s and which for a lot of people was kind of uh, very bad for comics in general and I'll kind of talk about what I mean by that as we take a look through this uh, this book and the contents. Um, take a quick look at the spine there. This book is going to be getting a reprint towards the end of this year which is uh, one reason why I thought I'd take a look at it today just to kind of give people maybe a chance to get a look at this in advance and, uh, and you know plan ahead and think about whether or not they uh, they want it if you're not entirely sure what it is um but when i say that it's kind of a huge bloated event what i mean by that is that through the 90s there was a huge tent trend of just doing massive events that crossed over with so many books and to kind of prove that point or to make that point for itself i'll just have a quick look through the uh, the contents here which you know feel free to pause and take a look yourself but uh, we've got Cable, issues 32 to 36, Uncanny X-Men 333 to 337, X-Force 55 and 57 to 58, uh, X-Man 15 to 19, X-Men 53 to 57, X-Men Unlimited 11, Onslaught X-Men Avengers, uh, no, sorry, Onslaught X-Men is the own thing, Avengers 401 to 402, Fantastic Four, 415, Incredible Hulk, 444 to 445, Wolverine, 104 to 105. How am I still going with this? X Factor, 125 to 126, Amazing Spider-Man, 415, Green Goblin, number 12, Spider-Man, 72, Iron Man, 332, Punisher, 11, Thor, 502, Onslaught Marvel Universe, X-Men Annual, 96, Onslaught Epilogue, X-Men Road to Onslaught, and Material from... Excalibur 100 and Fantastic Four, issue 416. I mean, wow, it's uh, yeah, a huge amount of stuff in there. Um, and that's what I mean by saying that imagine trying to follow this whole thing at the time. It's all well and good now to read this in an omnibus and get the whole thing in one book, which makes it, you know, the most convenient way to, to read it. But I can't imagine how annoying that would have been to be collecting in the 90s. You know, I wasn't collecting back then, but uh, for anyone who was, and maybe a few people watching this will know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe you're one of them. But to try and buy all of those issues and to figure out what order to read them all in, it, uh, it's just, I can't, yeah, I don't even want to try thinking about it. It gives me a headache just imagining it. And I can only say that anybody who gave up on trying to follow this event and similar huge events back then because of that, I totally understand it, um, especially when, to be totally honest, it's not like this is the best thing in the world to read either. Uh, you know, it's it's fun, but I'm going to take a look through it and give you an idea of what exactly is in here. So you start off with this little excerpt from Uncanny X-Men issue 287. Um, purpose of this is focusing on the character of Bishop, who went back in time to join the X-Men in the present. Uh, and he was aware that at some point the X-Men had been betrayed by one of their own. And when he came back and was first introduced around the beginning of the kind of uh, you know, Jim Lee X-Men era, he assumed it was Gambit who was the traitor. But this series kind of shows who in fact was the traitor and what actually happened there. So there's going to be spoilers in here. I'm going to get that out of the way right now and tell you that. So I'm going to look through pretty much all of this book and uh, summarise a lot of stuff. Uh, as best I can, as best as I can remember it, because frankly, as you've just seen, looking through the, the contents, there's so much in here, I'm not going to pretend to remember it all completely. You know, I didn't even read this book that long ago. I read I read this omnibus about, uh, I don't know, maybe eight months ago or something like that, some point towards the end of last year. Uh, and I had a decent time reading it, but um, yeah, there's so much in here that honestly, some of it is quite forgettable. I'll be, I'll be honest with you right now and tell you not every issue in here is a total winner by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so we kind of start with these issues of Cable and towards the beginning of this book you're very much building up to the character of Onslaught revealing himself to 
initially the X-Men and, and X-Men related characters. So, you know, there's a huge amount of people involved in here, but primarily it starts out as an X-Men event, and that's because of who Onslaught is. So I'll give you a quick description of who Onslaught is, and I've kind of thought about how am I going to describe who Onslaught is before I started filming this video, and I've thought about this just in the past. And Onslaught as a character is such an amazing example of just comic book nonsense at its absolute peak. So to understand who Onslaught is, you've got to kind of go back a little bit and understand what happened in the X-Men Fatal Attractions storyline, which was a big event in its own right prior to this. Basically, I'm not going to summarise that, I've got enough to talk about here with this event, but at the end of that event, Professor X kind of decided enough was enough with Magneto and he used his telepathic powers to kind of siphon away the evil aspects of Magneto's personality um, and just wipe the evil away from him. Now that created, a, a, a Magneto kind of became a blank slate after that point, he kind of doesn't really remember who he is, but the evil aspect of his personality for some reason has been absorbed into Professor X, so Charles Xavier acted as a kind of psionic sponge and absorbed all those dark traits into his own personality and what then happens is that the dark parts of Magneto's personality combine with Professor X and create a kind of amalgam being of psionic energy who represents aspects of both of those two people. So Onslaught, I mean that made no sense. Even as I was speaking then I'm thinking that this makes no sense and to be honest I don't think anybody writing this thought it really made a whole lot of sense either. They just had to do something to try and explain who that character was going to be. Um, so yes, yeah, in a nutshell, without pretending it makes a lick of sense, um, Onslaught is a mixture of, is a powerful psychic being who is somehow a combination of Magneto and Professor X, and he looks a lot like Magneto. Um, yeah, so take that as you will. If you manage to follow that and understand that, well done. Um, the artwork, I'll say throughout here as well, a real mixed bag of 90s stuff. Now, if you are like me, and for some reason have a fondness for this kind of artwork, even though you can look at it and say, objectively speaking, that's not very good, then you probably have a good time looking through here. If though, and I understand totally, to be honest, if you feel this way, if you don't like this kind of as I say, peak extreme 90s exaggerated cartoony style, then yeah, I got bad news for you. This this book is absolutely chock full of it. Um, and you know, it's as I say, it's just with any kind of crossover event, you're always going to get a huge variety of artwork because of just the sheer amount of artists that are working on the different series. Um, but for the most part, it all looks kind of similar. Um, some of the best stuff comes in the issues of X-Men themselves rather than the crossover issues I think but even so there isn't really any one artist in here or one particular series running through it that I think has particularly good artwork you know it, for me it just kind of ranges from yeah that's pretty bad to okay that's 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 kind of good kind of good is about as good as it sort of gets in here and yet, even so, I still kind of like it. I don't know why, but um, I just sort of do. The story, though, is all over the place, really. So you get... So this is Magneto, by the way. This is He's calling... He's going by the name of Joseph at this point in time, and he doesn't know... He doesn't remember his past, so he doesn't know that he was Magneto. He doesn't remember anything, basically. But obviously everyone else still knows who he is, and kind of resents him for the stuff that he did in the past, even though he himself is struggling to understand why people feel that way because he, you know, doesn't remember it himself. Uh, and then you've got Professor X acting more and more strangely as we get to the point where uh, it turns out he's actually Onslaught because basically Onslaught is, is sort of brewing up inside of Professor X and uh, slowly taking over him. Um, until it all it kind of you know gets to a point where it just kind of explodes and all starts to kick into action, um, which starts to happen shortly after here. Um, 
but honestly, it's, it's just there's so much going on in this book. It's a massive book. It's, it's a huge event, arguably too big, because quite honestly, you could cut out a lot of the stuff in here. This event could have been seriously streamlined, but obviously that's not how they did things back then. They wanted everything to be as big as possible, and, it, you know, these kind of massive events were just the norm back then. To an extent, still are, really, you know... We've never moved away from the kind of big crossover event, but I think it was particularly excessive with this event. This, as I say, this is pretty much the epitome of of the big '90s crossover events, really. Uh, in here as well, around this time, you've got the kind of animalistic Wolverine, the bone claws Wolverine, the noseless Wolverine. Uh, this is actually a really cool scene. This is where everybody starts to realise something is wrong with Professor X. The X Men issues, and I, you know, I say that I said the, my favourite sort of art is in these X Men issues, but the story is at its best when it focuses on Onslaught himself, which might sound obvious, but a lot of the story actually focuses on, you know, like, in terms of the crossovers. I mean, and what's going on with other characters at the same time, and only very indirectly involves Onslaught. But this opening scene with this fight where Onslaught appears and he's kind of established as being incredibly powerful. He takes out all the X-Men. Um, and they're all just kind of like, what the hell are we going to do? You know, our mentor, father figure, friend, teacher, has just become this super evil creature. Um, but this is where it starts to expand as well. So you know from the title, they call it, it's not X-Men Onslaught, it's X-Men Avengers Onslaught. And you could really call it X-Men Avengers Fantastic Four Onslaught because all three of those teams, those groups, are pretty much at the centre of what ends up happening at this event. Plenty more examples throughout here of the art style. You know, the, as I say, it's pretty consistent. And then it looks like this all the way through. Um, Apocalypse shows up. He's kind of observer he acts as a kind of observer to these events because you know his whole philosophy is very literal interpretation of survival of the fittest of the strongest so from his point of view when onslaught starts wreaking havoc and threatening to pretty much end the world apocalypse is pretty happy with that because he's just like yeah sounds good to me those who survive will deserve to survive and those who die deserve to die so he just kind of watches um the story cuts back to him literally just watching a few times. In fact, he starts watching it with the Watcher, <laughs> aptly enough. Um, but yeah, so Onslaught's schemes, what, is Onslaught, what does he actually want to do? Well, to be honest, nothing particularly unique or interesting. He basically is just full of rage and uh, he thinks that the Earth is ruined by humanity, you know, and he pretty much just decides he's going to ultimately kill everything. You know, it's a pretty generic evil scheme, to be honest, in the end. Um, nothing too interesting about it. He just sets up a kind of base in New York, and from there he manages to kind of psionically take control of a huge amount of uh, sentinels. And... Yeah, so there ends up being a kind of massive sentinel invasion in New York. All centers around New York, as so many things do. At the same time, Onslaught wants to take, uh, what's he called? Franklin Richards, that's it. Um, Reed and Sue Richards' son. Because Franklin Richards himself, although a young child, is already a very powerful mutant. And Onslaught wants to take his power for himself. So that's how the Fantastic Four get brought into things. Um, and yes, yeah, so it, it is a cool event. When the story focuses on these three key groups, for the most part, that's the good stuff. It's when it cuts away to other less directly involved characters, including the Hulk. Um, that it's not quite as good. It's not as focused. Um, as I say, it's just a case of, I think it's just too, it's just crossover fever. I don't know why every event had to cross over with so many other things so much. I, mean, I know it was like cynical, really. They just wanted to try and incentivize sales. Um, but for example, you know, if you've seen my recent videos on uh, the Peter David Hulk omnibus, 
volumes one to three, you'll know how much I love that run, how much I love Peter David's entire run. But it frustrates me at this point because he's still writing the Hulk here. This is issue uh, 444 of the Hulk, written by Peter David. And it just kind of, you know, editorially being forced to tie your series into a big event like this when it doesn't necessarily need to be. You know, this isn't really a, a story that needs to concern the Hulk, but he has to be brought in because, you know, Marvel said so. So all of a sudden you get Peter David having to force his run to go in this particular direction when, you know, if he didn't have to, I'm sure he wouldn't have done that. If we, you know, so I don't know. Slight uh, little rant there maybe, but you just get the feeling that uh, it must be quite frustrating to be a writer for a Marvel or DC or, you know, whatever, and be told that you've got to make your story tie in with a particular event, whether you like it or not. Anyway, as we get back to it, um, the court, this is a nice issue though, this one with uh, Wolverine and Electra. The two of them had a kind of friendly relationship during the 90s. And it's it's nice because you see a little bit of exploration of, of Wolverine's character. At this point, as I say, he had the adamantium stripped out of stripped away from his bones and for some reason that made him become really kind of animalistic he started to look less human he started to look more sort of neanderthal type thing and it's you know it, it's affecting him there's a good issue there just to see how that affects him but you don't really get any quiet character moments beyond that in this series there's just there's, there's no time for it everything's too large in scale this is where the sentinels get uh, taken over by Onslaught and this is where he puts his full scheme into motion um, oh, there's just so many characters involved in this thing honestly I'm looking through this and it's like stuff's coming back to me but in, in a way only vaguely so you've got the, the Dark Beast who came back to the real Marvel Universe from the Age of Apocalypse he had been posing as the real beast with the X-Men and none of them knew that it wasn't really Hank McCoy, it's the evil Hank McCoy from Age of Apocalypse. And he's here, uh, and I don't even remember why, Not you know, fighting Sabretooth and Mystique, cool stuff, you know, visually, but story-wise, why is it happening? Don't remember anymore. I, I just don't, sorry. It's, that's what I mean, that the story is, it is bloated. That's the best word for it, I think. There's, there's so much in here, it's too much to remember, for me anyway. I mean, you know, a few months after reading it, it doesn't all stick with me anymore. Only the key bits really do. Um, this is where, you know, so you get the Sentinels invading New York. It's a crossover with Spider-Man here. This is during an era where Peter Parker had apparently lost his powers as well. So, you know, Ben Riley was the active Spider-Man, Peter Parker was not. But Peter Parker's here in New York during this stuff. And really during this part of the book, what you get is this is where the main chunk of the crossovers all come in. Um, and it's just pretty much how different characters based in New York are all dealing with this Sentinel invasion. Yeah. There's even this weird issue of Green Goblin. It was an, a short-lived Green Goblin series in the 90s that focused on some random guy who'd found a set of old Green Goblin armor and was using it to try and be a superhero. Uh, it didn't last very long. In fact, I think the issue in there, in, in this book, was one of the last issues of that series, and it was only about issue 13. But yeah, you see here the more Spider-Man involvement, just fighting the Sentinels. This is where it kind, of, it kind of started to lose me here a bit, to be honest, because seeing other characters randomly trying to dodge and take down Sentinels is okay, but in a small dose, you don't need like dozens of pages of it, of different issues. And during all this, you, you're not really seeing much of Onslaught, it's like it's taking you away from the story, you know, to, to look at stuff that's just less important. You know, even during all this, like how many pages am I flicking through here? Not even seeing anything to do with Onslaught anymore. 
that you know is around and is planned ongoing, but the sheer amount of crossovers to take you away from the, the main action. And finally, you know, this this is the stuff I like, where you get the main you get the, the plan, the heroes forming the plan of attack. That's a cool double page spread. I like that. Um, and eventually, yeah, so what's happened is Onslaught has set up a kind of fortress in uh, Central Park in New York. And the heroes just uh, are planning their, their assault on it. You can see Onslaught there again. You get some cool extras though through here, by the way, scattered throughout the book. You get these kind of trading card images from the 90s. That's a cool addition to the book, definitely. Uh, this is um, so. This is Franklin Richards. He got taken by onslaught, and this is Charles Xavier, and they are both somewhere in the mind of onslaught. So Charles Xavier is kind of unconscious, sort of comatose. Franklin Richards trying to wake him up. Here you go. See the Watcher and Apocalypse just stand and watch the chaos and uh, debate philosophically uh, about the nature of life and what's going on. Ultimately they do free Professor X. Um, and then they all, I said they put the plan of attack together. I, I just don't remember all the details, you know, it's uh, not necessarily the most informative of my reviews, I will admit that wholeheartedly, but that's only because it's not one of the most memorable stories. It's sort of fun to read it, mostly as you read it, but I would imagine for the vast majority of people, you're going to forget a lot of the details of it not that long after you've read it. It doesn't stay with you like the truly great comic runs stay with you, you know. This is not on that level. This isn't up there with something like Frank Miller's Daredevil, Jeff John's Green Lantern, or uh, Walt Simonson's Thor. It's not up there with that kind of thing at all. Getting to the point now, I think, where they initiate the final assault. But yeah, it's, you know, it's just a lot of 90s action here. You know, it's just extreme 90s artwork throughout. It's either a style that you like, I feel like it's either something you like or you really dislike. You don't tend to find people who are sort of in the middle about it. these trading card images and so say they're scattered throughout. They're a cool feature. <laughs> this version of Thor as well in the, in the 90s, I've forgotten all about that. One of those horrendously bad 90s comic costume designs there, and Thor with all the random armor, ridiculously long hair, and for some reason a big chain on Mjolnir. Why? Because 90s. That's why. And I don't even really remember what's going on in this issue. Right? Like, you know. <laughs> feel like I'm just so uninformed doing this review. I have read it, I promise. Um, oh yeah, this is this is one of the ones I do remember. This is one of the crossovers about, I feel like the only one I actually do specifically have some memory of. This is where Wolverine kind of uh, is diving into a burning building. This is one of the solo Wolverine issues. Um, and he manages to, you know, save some kids. And this is all going on, you know, during the time of, obviously, Onslaught's attack on New York. Um, 
So that's cool. Yeah, that, that was one of the good ones. That was one of the, the crossover issues where I thought that was good. You know, and I felt like some reason for that to be in here. Um, and then even the human torch even shows up at the end and is like, come on, Logan, we've got to get you to the main action. Um, and this issue, Fantastic Four 416, was I think the final issue of the original volume of Fantastic Four that began in um, 1961, or 60 years ago this year. Because what ends up happening after this book is the uh, launch of Heroes Reborn, where the image creators, well, Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld anyway, in their studios, temporarily took charge of uh, Fantastic Four and Avengers related stories. And we'll get to why that happens in a minute. <laughs> Maybe in a long minute, because this is just so long and drawn out, this event. Yeah, getting there. Promise we're getting there. I'm not gonna lie, when I read this book, it seemed to be quite a long read. You know, I didn't race through this book. Um, and by the time I did, I finished it, I did feel a kind of relief, like, finally. <laughs> you know, it felt like much more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, you read some omnibus and you just kind of get through them so quickly and you think, wow, amazing. And then you get through others where if you manage to make it to the end, you just feel exhausted. So this is about, this is kind of the, uh, we're getting to the climax of the, the event here. What ends up happening? And again, I'm going to describe this without it making a whole lot of sense because it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Onslaught is revealed in his true form, which is, is these kind of blue bubbly things. Um, so he doesn't have a physical form. He's just kind of immaterial. And for some reason, it's discovered that the only way that they can beat him is for a whole bunch of heroes to dive headfirst into this blue cloudy bubble. Um, and the more of them that jump in there, the more weakened he is. But only non-mutants can go in, so none of the X-Men can jump in. Only the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and you know any other characters that are there who aren't mutants can jump in. Um, something really weird happens with Bruce Banner that affects Peter David's Hulk as well. But what happens is, uh, Banner and the Hulk get separated into two different beings. You've seen that here, in fact, where Bruce Banner kind of gets out of the Hulk. The Hulk is still there. Banner goes into the blue cloud and the Hulk remains here in the real Marvel universe. Um, and it all blows up and it explodes with all those heroes inside. And that... Uh, defeats Onslaught. It's very sudden. Like, I mean, we've just seen it happen in the last few pages and it's, it happens quite abruptly in the end. It takes a million years to get there as you read through the book. And then the actual final ending just sort of happens. But in a nutshell, as far as everybody thinks now in the Marvel main Marvel Universe, those characters have died. So the Avengers are dead, Fantastic Four are dead, uh, Hulk's kind of dead. Um... And you've got, you know, the X-Men and people left over now mourning them. What actually happened is they've all gone to a kind of alternate world. Franklin Richards created what we call Pocket Universe, um, where, you know, Fantastic Four and Avengers, they've all gone to that alternate world, basically. And that ends up being the Heroes Reborn universe. So Heroes Reborn spins out of this completely. Um, so this, you know... If you're wondering how to get to Heroes Reborn, this is what you have to read first. This leads into that. Think of Heroes Reborn as a kind of sequel, or at least think of it as a consequence of this. Maybe not a sequel, it's probably not the best way to describe it, but yeah. That all happens because they jumped into the blue bubble cloud. And uh, yeah, so you get 
towards the end you actually get some of the the, the nicest moments in the book the the more chilled down to earth moments where characters finally get to just sit down and have a breather um think about what happened but professor x is held accountable for what onslaught did because as far as a lot of people are concerned it was professor x so the book kind of ends on this sort of cliffhanger really with um professor x being taken away from the uh you know the the mansion the x mansion and he's taken away to some pretty uh <laughs> bad sort of facility place i don't know some some dodgy science institution that's supposedly good oh, and obviously yeah there's a baseball match of course there's a baseball match so professor x is taken away to some you know some place that's not good and the x-men have a baseball game which is <laughs> full of ridiculous 90s art and then this kind of broken sentinel turns up uh and they, they blow him up, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is that. Um, that's actually, yeah, a fun issue, to be honest. But by this time, by the time you get into this point, I, I was just done. I was, I was feeling done with it. I needed a break. This is the stuff where Professor X is in this institution. They're experimenting on him. And it doesn't even have... I, 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 this kind of goes into what happens post-onslaught, really, but they throw it in here at the end of this book. But in effect, already by this point, the onslaught story is concluded. And this is just kind of a very small bit of lead into, as I say, post-onslaught, what comes next stuff. Uh, yeah, so, all in all, this book is, uh, worth reading, I suppose. Like, this isn't getting as strong of a thumbs up from me as pretty much every other book I've reviewed so far on this channel. This is something that is very much, I think, an acquired taste. If you are fully into 90s comics, then definitely dive in. Um, you know, if you like the 90s comic events and somehow haven't read this one, even though I feel if you already love 90s comic events, you've probably drawn, your attention's probably been drawn to this at some point before. But unless you really like that era, um, you could probably skip this book, to be totally honest. Um, it's just that, it's not that it's bad, it's just that only about, I don't know, only the main story featuring the X-Men which is really only a small portion of the contents of this book, is probably the stuff that's really worth reading, and then the rest of it is really quite skippable. Um, but hopefully that look through the book has been insightful, if nothing else, to help you one way or the other. You know, I, I'm not going to pretend it's a fantastic read, um, but at the same time, I think it is kind of fun, and a lot of the artwork is a bit of a guilty pleasure for me. Um, it's something I will reread again, but I'll probably skip over a lot of stuff when I do. So yeah, take it all as you will. And hopefully you know now, maybe a little bit more than you did before as to whether or not you want to pick this book up at some point. Um, but thanks for watching anyway, guys. Thanks for pushing through this with me. Um, it was a bit of a slog just to review it. Never mind, read it. Um, but yeah, so again, just thank you for watching. If you want to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel. As always, I appreciate any support you can give me. And uh, yeah, I'll get back to you soon, hopefully with uh, with something else.